Okay. Um, you are most welcome to our webinar, which is a closing event for our EAPC task force on volunteering. I am Lena Belteri and I am a co-chair of this task force. And I also work as a CEO of the National Organization for Space Austria in Vienna. My co-chair and in the meantime, a very good friend, uh, Ross Todd and I are very happy that, you, that almost 200 people from all over the world are here tonight or this afternoon or this night, whatever the time is where you are. I just got the information about the countries where you are all from, and that made me very happy and excited. I just to have, have to tell you some of these countries uh, because I found it so great. Uh, Portugal, USA, Korea, Norway, Indonesia, Spain, Canada, Czech Republic, Trinidad, Tobago, India, Serbia, UK, Poland, Finland, Switzerland, Turkey, Singapore, Netherlands, Brazil, Australia, Austria, Germany, France, Malaysia, Denmark, Ireland, Armenia, uh, and Iraq. So you are all, all very, very welcome uh, to share the next one and a half hours with us. To start with, we would like to introduce you also our steering group members and the volunteers who are uh, speaking here today. I would ask uh, Stephen van der Stichelen uh, to say hello to everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see so many people. I'm Stephen van der Stichelen. I'm a researcher at the end of, end of Life Care uh, Research Group and a part of the steering committee of the Task Force on Volunteering. Thank you. And Chiara Caracca from Italy. Good afternoon to you all. I'm really glad to, hear, to be here with you. And I know that uh, more people is uh, going to join us in, uh, in the next minutes. Uh, I am uh, a part of the steering group of the Italian Federation for Palliative Care. And uh, I'm a general manager of an uh, Italian organization, which name is uh, Presenza Amica. And of course, I'm part of this beautiful task force. Thank you. And Catherine Renard from France. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine. I am uh, French. I've been a volunteer for 21 years and uh, very happy to be part of this task force. It has been really great. And just seeing all this country coming up in the chat line, I nearly have the goose skin because um, I always had this idea to be part of a big, big movement all around the world. So this is it here under my eyes. Thank you. See you later. Okay, thank you. Katarina Sitsevich from uh, Serbia. Good afternoon to all. I'm so happy to be here with, uh, with all of you. And uh, I'm a social worker and coordinator for volunteers from Serbia. Thank you. And we have Catherine Walsh, who is going to speak to you longer today. Uh, you will see her then uh, later. Catherine, you just want to say hello. Hello everyone, Catherine Walsh here from Lancaster University in the UK and also the representative of the EAPC board on the Volunteering Task Force. Great to have you here. We also have Lukas Radbuch and Anne Gusensen uh, at the, um, in our steering group, but I think they are not here yet. Anne is here. Yes. <laughs> Hello, I was as a member. Oh, now I'm okay. logged in in the right way. Very pleased to meet you. I work in Utrecht at the University of Humanistic Studies. Very good, thank you, Anne. And then we have two more volunteers who are going to tell their stories today. It is Monica Niedermeyer from Austria, from Innsbruck. Hello, my name is Monica. I'm so glad to join you. And I'm very impressed uh, seeing all the countries where the people are from. And I'm looking forward to you. Great. And then there is the Enisa Sabotic uh, from uh, uh, Bell Hospice from Serbia. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be a part of this community and webinar. And I'm happy to hear that uh, we are all around, around the world. Thank you. Great that you are all here. Uh, so we would like to tell you a little bit 
the so, a small story of our task force on volunteering by highlighting some of the projects and events that we have been working on during the last eight years. Uh, could we have the first slide, please? So here you could see the steering group at once, and then the next one. So uh, we have organized uh, many uh, international uh, symposia at the EAPC congresses. The last one was in Berlin 2019, where we had more than 300 uh, people from all over the world uh, talking about volunteering. Um, the next one is that we have uh, been working on research as well. So we have evaluated our EAPC Madrid Charter. I hope that you all have signed it and you have all read about it. Uh, it is about the importance of the role of volunteers in the care of patients and families, and also very important, sustaining hospice and palliative care services. This charter has been translated into 13 languages, so you can all look if it is already translated to your own mother tongue. Then a part of our story project where we are going to introduce the books today is that we also um, made um, a research study to that, what it means to be a palliative care volunteer that was in uh, eight European countries. And you are going to hear to, uh, today more of the, our uh, COVID-19 um, uh, study from Catherine Walsh. We have been very active also uh, working on a lobby uh, for volunteers and we have been negotiating, Ross and me, many times with uh, about the World Hospice and Palliative Care Day so that we volunteers could be part of these days 2019 with my care, my right, and 2020, my care, my comfort. And now my co-chair, Ross Scott, is going to tell you more about our work. The next slide, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> one of the first outputs from the task force was our white paper defining volunteering in hospice and palliative care in Europe. And this paper um, particularly looked at um, a consensus definition and the topology of hospice and palliative care volunteering, exploring the role and the position and the identity and value of, of volunteering in this sector. As Lena has always mentioned, we're going to say a little bit more about the story project, which was uh, a larger project with a number of aspects, and that's uh, going to come later in the webinar. And um, I think Lena mentioned lobbying in her last slide. And I, I don't know whether we lobbied or cornered people and um, spoke to them and persuaded them very hard, which I remember doing with um, uh, uh, the people uh, who led the research for the EAPC Atlas um, in palliative care, because although it had mentioned volunteering in the past, there was nothing specific about volunteering. And we were so thrilled when the researchers agreed to work with our task force um, to develop a, a standalone chapter in the 2019 edition, and hopefully that will continue. Um, also, a number of task force members worked on um, a project looking at a minimum data set for volunteering. Only a small number of countries collect national data or, uh, or even data at a local level on volunteering. And it's so important to understand um, what is happening in terms of trends so that it's possible to um, plan uh, for the future and, and plan services. And so um, a small project was undertaken to develop a consensus on a minimum data set with information such as numbers of volunteers, where volunteers are deployed, hours donated, activities, who leads and manages volunteers, how many patients receive support. And this was presented at a poster in Berlin and a number of countries have expressed an interest in piloting this. Um, and then um, last but not least, um, with a great deal of help from Stephen and Avril Jackson at EAPC, um, we have uh, now had a social media presence with 
at EAPC blogs, Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn, and we're delighted with everyone who helped us to do that. Could we have the next slide, please? I don't intend to go through all of these, but these are examples of some of our publications. And if you go to the task force webpage on the EAPC website, you will be able to find the links to these. And the last slide, this is a range of our blogs as well. Um, we've been, been very lucky and a number of people have written short blogs about many different aspects of volunteering. And again, you can find these at our website. So thank you very much. Um, and we're ready for the next presentation. Um, of Catherine's uh, presentation. Because I'm delighted to introduce Professor Catherine Walsh, who has been, uh, who's, as she has said, is our board link and has led um, this international study exploring um, the continuing impact of volunteering in hospice and palliative care. Um, I should say before I hand over to Catherine that we've had so many questions submitted to us um, today uh, for the webinar. And we're only going to have time to answer just a very few, but we will answer all of your questions that we can, and we will send these out to you um, following the webinar so that we can respond to as many as possible. So thank you to all of you who shared these questions. So Catherine, you're very welcome and I hand over to you now. Thanks very much, Ros. So I'm absolutely delighted to be talking today about some pretty hot off the press results from uh, a survey that we conducted under the auspices of the EAPC Volunteering Task Force. Um, and so the first thing I really have to do is to give a huge thanks to everybody who was part of that. Um, it certainly was a team effort. And so here's an acknowledgement to everybody that was part of that team, bringing together uh, the survey and in the analysis of the data that we received. So thank you, really a European effort. Now, I'm going to start off by a few slides just emphasising the importance of volunteering. And here I suspect I really am preaching to the converted, because if you're here at a volunteering webinar, you're likely to have that interest in volunteering. But just as a reminder, we know from some previous data that there are generally speaking, and this was UK data, but it's often similar in other areas across Europe, there are one and a half volunteers per paid member of staff. So in many of the organisations, the number of volunteers is larger than the number of paid staff. So we know that volunteers are critically important contributors to the organisations within which they volunteer. And they volunteer across a range of roles. Again, this is from the same survey data. And the size of the square indicates the number of volunteers working in areas where, as you can see from the top, these are care services run entirely by volunteers. There was additional data as well about contributions, but I just wanted to emphasize that in some services, in some countries, there are some elements of that service that are entirely run by volunteers. The point that I'm making here is that volunteers are uh, or were absolutely critical to the way that specialist hospice and palliative care is delivered across Europe and uh, beyond. Volunteers are really important. And just to highlight some of our previous work here at Lancaster, we also showed that volunteers were safe and effective. So they're not only numerous, they're not only providing essential care, but we also know that volunteers provide safe, effective care with a relationship, and you'll see why I wanted to highlight this later, with a relationship from some of that data indicating that the more hours of support received from a volunteer, the greater the impact that volunteer can have on the important outcomes uh, that patients um, and family carers experience. So volunteers are numerous, volunteers are important, volunteers are safe, volunteers are effective. I think you probably know that already. And you certainly know what happened next. 
So the, the, the world, not just the world of hospice and palliative care, was pretty much turned upside down by the COVID-19 pandemic and particularly by the fairly rapid um, stay at home notices that many people received and a real focus on um, what people would call essential services and um, changes to the way that specialist uh, palliative care was provided and certainly of course expanding specialist hospice and palliative care to care for those with COVID. So COVID would have had an impact at various levels across these organisations from the type of care they were providing to the uh, restrictions that were in place nationally and internationally. Now, I was lucky enough to be part of a, a national team here in the UK examining some of the impact of that right at the beginning of the pandemic. So the paper I'm going to show you uh, here for those who might be interested in, in looking at it, it is um, open access, so I think anyone can access it, was a multinational survey. So although it was a UK team, the data came from, uh, you know, uh, across Europe and beyond to the rest of the world. Um, and we collected these data in 2020. So these were data that were collected pretty much at the beginning to the, you know, the mid stage of the pandemic. So this is early data, understanding the early impact on volunteers of the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we showed in this sort of early doors data, that there were only a minority of services so this was service level data where there was a lot or slightly more use of volunteers. But what was overwhelmingly obvious from that data that whilst 9% had a slightly less use of volunteers, nearly 70% of organisations across the world that responded to this survey indicating that they were using volunteers much less than previously. So it was what I would call a catastrophic decline in the contribution of volunteers to hospice and specialist palliative care. Now, when we were discussing this as part of the EAPC volunteer task force uh, later on in the pandemic, we had some real questions about whether this decline was sustained, um, whether this was still the experience of services providing uh, palliative care and whether services had adjusted and reset themselves to enable volunteers to start to contribute again. So we decided to conduct a survey to look at these, uh, this information in more depth and detail. So some of you might have seen our call for uh, people to participate in the survey, uh, which we did in conjunction with my organisation here at Lancaster University um, in terms of uh, obviously uh, approving and giving us uh, ethics approval to conduct that. So we launched the uh, survey and uh, it was electronic again at an organisational level. And we collected data in uh, 2021. I don't know, I've got the dates in front of me, but sort of March to or May to July 2021. So uh, very much a year on, at least a year on, more than a year on for some respondents into the pandemic. So what did we find? Well, first of all, we were absolutely delighted with the response to the survey. We had responses from 304 organisations across 34 countries. Um, and you can see there the geographical region of the responding organisations. The vast majority came from Europe. Unsurprisingly, we are a, a European uh, volunteering task force and clearly we were promoting this very strongly through the EAPC and through our European networks. So uh, nearly 40% from Western Europe, um, slightly lower percentages from other areas of uh, Europe and the British Isles. But we did have representation from pretty much no one from Antarctica. I'm not sure there are many palliative care volunteers in Antarctica, but we did have at least some response from pretty much every continent. So it's clearly not 
totally representative, but um, clearly a, a really uh, positive, encouraging response rate in terms of the conclusions that we can draw from this survey in terms of what was happening in mid 2021 for these organisations. And they were all hospice and specialist palliative care organisations that were responding to the survey. So we asked them a range of questions. So, and I've just pulled out, I can't, there isn't time to present all of the data, but I pulled out some of the areas that I thought people might be particularly interested in. So some of the key questions that people ask is, were these organisations actually providing care to people with COVID? And the answer by and large was often yes. 47% of responding organisations had cared for people with uh, confirmed or suspected COVID, primarily confirmed COVID. They know that they are uh, people that have a, a PCR confirmed COVID test. 55% of the organisations that responded had had staff who had had COVID. And 37% of the organisations had volunteers with COVID. Although it must be said, we asked a very a general question with a supplementary question of, and with some free text data about whether there were any concerns about whether the volunteers who had uh, COVID had uh, contracted that as a result of their relationship with the specialist palliative care service. And by and large, they said no. And the reason for the no will become apparent as we uh, go through this presentation because they said only a limited number of volunteers were in the building. They were tested regularly. No volunteers had suspected COVID-19 that was supported in the building. But of course, volunteers are part of their local community. So, um, it, you know, where they did have COVID, the likelihood was that that was not contracted as a result of their volunteering experiences, but because of the general community transmission of COVID, which of course was happening uh, everywhere at that particular point in time. We then asked questions about how many volunteers these organisations had. And I think it's really important that we recognise, again, the size of the volunteering um, workforce. Work Is workforce the right word for volunteers? I don't think it is, but anyway. So we found that of the organisations that were responding, they had a mean of 203 volunteers per organisation deployed pre-pandemic. And for those of you who are with, um, with those sorts of tendencies, there are actually 203 uh, people on that screen just there as a visualisation of the size of uh, the deployment of volunteers within those organisations. We then asked them how many volunteers were deployed now, post-pandemic. Are we post-pandemic? Anyway, at the time they were answering the uh, questionnaire. And that's where I think the data is really quite shocking. So in a terms of the visual representation there, only a mean of 33 volunteers were deployed post-pandemic. So even a year or more into the pandemic, the number of active volunteers, and that's the way we froze the question, active volunteers was again a catastrophic de decline across the organisations who were responding. And when we asked them uh, what sort of services those volunteers were had been uh, deployed within and were now deployed within, we could see uh, there were particular areas where that decline was particularly notable. So there was a 71% decline of volunteers in uh, the sort of functions like uh, being on reception, serving teas and coffees, gardening, catering, so those sorts of support services. There was a 72% decrease in the volunteers who provided direct patient facing support. There was an 84% decrease in the volunteers of what I call back office functions, fundraising, for example, or um, other sorts of administrative or coordinating jobs, and a 91% decrease in the volunteers who worked in the retail sector, um, uh, say, for example, in fundraising shops. Unsurprisingly, of course, because some of those shops were also closed at certain points during the pandemic. So uh, perhaps unsurprising that that was the largest uh, decrease. 
uh, but certainly a 72% decrease in the patient facing functions is going to have potentially a serious impact on the way that care is provided. And these are the sorts of things that people said, we had to pause volunteering. We've only kept indirect volunteering. We might have brought them back, but then we had to pause them again and again. So there's a continual interruption to the way that volunteers were working. We could also see a change in the age patterns of these active volunteers. So we asked people to estimate, and we do recognise that it is only an estimate, the ages of the active volunteers within the organisation. Pre-pandemic, 21% of those volunteers were over 70. At the time of answering the survey, only 10% of those volunteers were over 70. Pre-pandemic, 28% of the volunteers were under 50. Post or during pandemic, a year into the pandemic, 43%. Now that's in the context of a general reduction of volunteers, of course, but in that general reduction of volunteers, what we can see is a shifting of these ages of people being involved, which I think potentially has some fundamentally important uh, messages or lessons for how we move might move volunteering forwards in the future. We asked them about new volunteering roles that they may well have created. And actually, this is where we were really quite surprised because um, hospices and specialist palliative care services have a reputation for being quite innovative and certainly in the volunteering sphere for being uh, innovative in very creative ways. But in actual fact, only 17% reported that they had created any new volunteering roles, although 35% did offer some form of virtual volunteering, which often included telephone support, which had already been in place for some of them uh, prior to the pandemic. So uh, again, I think it's interesting to unpick perhaps why that was. Um, I'm sure just the, the total impact of the pandemic generally um, and the way that people had to respond to that, of course, will have had a, an, a, a real influence in terms of the time people had to devote to creating potentially these new roles. So did this decline have an impact? Yes, it did. 51% of those who uh, responded said that this decline in volunteers had had an impact on their organisation. And they gave some um, quite um, challenging to read sometimes examples of the impact that, that had had, particularly on their patients that they cared for. So this is one of the respondents, terrible. I mean, you know, what a way to start a terrible lot of patients and families did not have the support for needed, you know, because the, the visits were all banned and still are banned now. So real impact. And here, respondent 239, our volunteers are equally necessary in caring for our patients. They help the nurses, they give and prepare food, they make vets. When there are no volunteers, the nurses can't take care of as many patients at the same time because they are understaffed. And they also reflected on the contribution of volunteers to the whole ethos and atmosphere of the organisation. So not just, you know, pairs of hands helping, but actually fundamentally important people within the organisation. So here's another quote from Respondent 286. There's been a significant atmosphere uh, impact on the atmosphere and the role volunteers play in enabling conversations and joy. I thought that was quite, was deeply missed. Service users have been isolated from family and staff miss the support volunteers provide, particularly at the front of the house. And again, we've got many, many other examples. We're just obviously drawing a really small amount of data here for this presentation in terms of the impact that this decline of volunteers has had on the organisations who were responding to this survey over a year into the COVID pandemic. So what does that mean for volunteering? Well, I think it is quite clear from our data that there is a poorer quality of care without this major volunteer contribution. 
they talked quite a lot about loneliness and social isolation and impact. And we know that there is an impact of social relationships on health and well-being. And we also know from our previous work that the amount of volunteering impact also makes a difference. So it is likely that these patients will have been less well and less healthy as a result of this decline in volunteering. Given that many of the volunteering organisations that responded had great degrees of charitable funding, there is potentially an impact on the sustainability of organisations in terms of their financial flows, not just because the volunteers are involved in providing care, but the volunteers are also involved in the administration and understanding the finances and the fundraising and all those other aspects. Um, so it's not just about that direct patient care. So some organisations may well be quite vulnerable at the moment. It's probably sped up some changes in volunteering patterns that I think people were already noticing pre-pandemic. The changing age patterns of volunteers, the different work patterns of people who might otherwise have, have, have volunteered. I think that has um, sped up and recognising that these effects of the pandemic could be long term, um, you know, even another year or another few years, I think we're still going to be seeing these impacts. And so I think there's some really interesting questions about how we can avoid this sustained, very large reduction in the number of volunteers and reintroduce volunteers to organisations in a way that I think reflects this changing pattern. So I think there's much more I could uh, say uh, from the data that we've collected and those who've been analysing it with me probably realise that is just a snapshot of some of the data, but my 20 minutes are up. So I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions that people might want me to address. Thank you. You're muted, Roz. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we've had some, well, people may wish to type some questions into the chat. We've had one or two sent in advance. Um, I think some of you have answered. Um, I, I maybe pick up on this one. Are there differences between the extent to which volunteers are retained during the pandemic, depending on the clinical context? I think you, you, you did cover that, but just wondered if you wanted to say any more about that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we saw a slightly less reduction in some of the clinical volunteers because I think they were probably perceived as being more an inverted commas essential. But we know that people talked about volunteers not necessarily being as essential to the organisation as the paid staff. So I think that's a, you know, we still saw a catastrophic decline in, in, in volunteers, even in that um, area. I think the the interesting thing is about those sorts of roles that people can fulfil and um, potentially how we conceptualise what we mean by a clinical volunteer. Are we talking about in-person, hands-on or face-to-face -face care or are we talking about care that can be delivered remotely? And I think if you'd have asked me that at the beginning of the pandemic, well, I didn't even think, you know, that, that people who were very um, technologically aware would shift to online working in the way that we have done. And I think we've now demonstrated that, that you know, there are many, many more people who could do that shift. So I think there's some questions about what we mean by clinical and can some of that be shifted? Because I think the other thing that we didn't really present just now was the concerns of some of the volunteers and the volunteers family about about being exposed to covid in the in the clinical setting and uh, some interesting data from people who said actually my family didn't want me to come in they were concerned about my well-being well-being so i think um you know that, that there is always going to be a balance between what is what is possible and what is probable for people to do don't see any questions coming up in the chat. So <clears throat> this is another question that's been sent in. Have there been any findings that surprised you in terms of country responses? Um, we have broken down some of the data by country, but I have to say, of course, it is primarily European and we've mostly aggregated it at the regional level 
because of course um, there were some countries where we might only have had a handful of uh, responses so uh, we're just preparing a paper for publication so you will see the countries in the appendix there um, so I think top prize goes to Germany they had the most number of responses from organizations and then probably fairly closely followed by uh, the UK so because of that slight disparity in terms of the numbers it wasn't particularly meaningful for the survey to actually analyze the data country by country so I'm absolutely sure there are some differences country by country because in the free text comments you could see people responding in terms of their own local restrictions um, and the particular variety of lockdown or <laughs> restrictions that was in place in their country at that time that might have had a, a major impact. So the answer is yes, I'm quite sure the country's made a difference, but no, we're not actually analysing that data by country just because it wouldn't be meaningful uh, for the number of participants we have on a country by country basis. Okay, um, so no questions coming in. Um... I think there are one or two questions actually. Are there? Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The, the, the differences by country was one of them, um, but I think someone else is uh, sort floating in. Um, okay. No, I might have. I might have just made yes. that. Up. It might have just been the one question. Okay. Um, I suppose that there's a question coming about the future, Catherine, and and I wonder what the data from the study suggests about. Um, volunteers returning um oh hold on here's another one but well, the, yeah. the question and what data is about volunteers yeah. returning yeah yeah and I, and I can see a question from Sheila yeah. Penn about a, an yeah. increased role for younger people I mean we're 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 currently uh, I say this is the royal we Ross has been looking at a lot of these data in terms of the the way forwards what was really interesting in terms of the way forwards so there's a very high proportion of respondents who actually said we want to bring the volunteers back to do exactly what they were doing before um, and a real you could sense a real desire to get back to where we were previously um, and I think one has to balance that desire with the likelihood of whether that's going to be possible or not. Uh, particularly, I think, because we saw a lot of data uh, about concerns about older people volunteering because of their increased vulnerability. So I think uh, there were a lot of organisations that were talking about their desire to bring younger people in as volunteers, but not really sure how to do that. Uh, and I think that came through from the data as well. You know, could we reach out? Through? So you just got the sense from the data that they they knew that was something that they had to do, but they weren't sure how to do it. So I think there is definitely a a, a policy role for thinking about um, you know how we might manage that and the different patterns of younger people as volunteers who may well have less time to give on a week by week basis so it could be shorter sharper volunteering roles with very discreet um, jobs or tasks uh, for people to achieve so I think we do need a fundamental sort of paradigm shift in the way that we think volunteers may well be contributing because I doubt it's going to be situation as it was, unfortunately, even though that might be the expressed desire of many of our respondents. Another question. Um, did you look at the correlation with volunteer managers being furloughed and or perception of positive volunteer culture within an organisation? No, we didn't ask an explicit, explicit question about furlough, so we, we don't know if these organisations had uh, furloughed any of the people who were responsible for uh, managing volunteers, although they were the people that we asked to fill out the survey, if at all possible. Um, there wasn't, I don't recall there being very much data about the impact of that at all. Um, and I can see there's a supp supplementary question about the positive volunteer culture within the organisation. Um, I think if we'd have done qualitative interviews with these people, that's what we would have heard about. I think we have to appreciate the restrictions of a survey and the and the free text, which they gave some very rich, detailed free text answers. Um, but I don't know that we can particularly answer about the uh, the volunteer culture with the organisation, sadly. Okay. And another question looking at, do you have data on how online volunteering worked? 
we asked if people had moved to virtual forms of volunteering and so that's where the data I was presenting that actually very few of them did so the answer is very few of them moved to online volunteering so that they weren't providing us with very much data about how it worked or not there is some free text comments um, with a lot of initial concern about uh, whether people would have the technological competence to do that but a recognition now a year plus in that actually people do they you know they've invested in the in the kit they've got the iPad or the mobile phone or whatever that will allow that but I, I don't think that most organizations that responded have really tapped into that enthusiasm or increasing competence um, certainly at the time they were answering the survey okay are there any other questions for Catherine I think we've got just a few more minutes I suppose just maybe one more, um, Catherine, did you get a sense there was a lot of, we talked about people wanting volunteers to come back um, as before, did you get a sense there was much preparation going into that happening? I mean, we asked questions about training and support, which I didn't have time to present today. So it was clear that people um, had maintained contact with their volunteers. So they, there was a lot of data about uh, virtual um, sort of get togethers, about newsletters, about email contact, about telephone contact. So organisations were clearly very keen to keep contact with their existing uh, volunteers. Um, and we also asked questions about the training of volunteers. And again, um, you could see some shift to online asynchronous, particularly training, that people were providing sort of online training modules for volunteers, etc. cetera. Um, but so they were maintaining contact, continuing to train volunteers, I'm not sure there was quite so much thinking going into and how they were going to return the volunteers to the organisation. So I think that's the, the piece from our data, I think that's probably still missing. I think just to say thank you so much, Catherine, that was a really interesting presentation. And, and I know there's a lot more data in that. And I think it was amazing that you covered so much in, in the 20 minutes. And thank you to everyone who either submitted questions online or added them to the chat. Thank you very much. And I noticed you have an invitation to speak. At, oh, I've missed um, that. <laughs> yeah, hold on till I see if I can scroll up. It's from Callum. I'll have a look in the chat in a moment. Look. That's okay. <laughs> so there you are. You're um, you're now in demand for sharing this information. So thank you very much indeed. Yeah, and keep your eyes open because we are just finishing a paper, although obviously there'll be a while before finishing and, and publication, but uh, we are plan planning to publish this data. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Now we are moving to the next, next part of our webinar. Um, could we have the next slides, please? So now we are going... Uh, to tell you uh, about our uh, so-called story project. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So we are very pleased to have this opportunity to share with you uh, the project on the experiences of hospice and palliative care volunteers. And this project had a number of different parts and took place over the life of both uh, the first and the second task force. Um, a significant number of people were involved and we would like to acknowledge this before going on to introduce a project and after that the most important of all uh, to our volunteer speakers and later on. Um, yes, we would like to uh, thank all the volunteers who have shared their stories so honestly. And I think it is such a joy to read all these uh, very moving stories. And you can then later on, uh, we will share, uh, share the books with you so you can look at them later. And uh, we would like to thank everyone who was gathering the stories because we had very many people in eight or also then later on also Serbia came on board uh, who were helping us to gather these stories. So thank you for all that. 
and of course all the task force members uh, who were involved in the first and in the second one and then um, Katarina Sipcevic and Jovana Bogicevic Pejic who uh, made the whole layout for these two books and I think it's really uh, beautiful and we have very many uh, nice pictures uh, from different countries in there and then I would like also to thank Anna Pisarek from Hospice Austria who really coordinated uh, all the stories so that we could have the books. Thank you Anna very much. And of course the EAPC board and uh, Julie Ling for this. Uh, for this project we also uh, made a research study together with Sheila Payne and Anna Gusensen, what it means to be a palliative care volunteer in eight European countries. You can also uh, read this. So thank you to everybody. So the next slide, please. So I'm, I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction uh, about our motivation, our approach, and the key messages that came from this project to give the background and the context. We were motivated to undertake this project as we recognized that too often the words and voices of volunteers were not seen or heard directly. The stories were often told by others. We were keen to understand how volunteers experienced working in hospice and palliative care in their own words, and so the project began. Our aims were initially to collect stories from volunteers from a number of different European countries and ulti ultimately to make this available online for everyone to read. We were also keen to analyze the stories, to explore what volunteering meant to volunteers and to understand what they, they were, if there were any similarities and differences to these experiences across the countries. So the next slide, please. Ross, now it's your turn again. So um, our approach throughout our network of <clears throat> task force contacts, we invited five volunteers um, from each of eight European countries in Austria, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland and the UK. And we asked just two questions to give a, a, a very broad framework. What do you do as a volunteer and what does volunteering mean to you? And volunteers contributed their stories in their own language <clears throat> and these were then translated into English. At a later stage we were delighted to include additional stories from Serbia um, where volunteers there had been part of a very similar project in their own country. Could we have the next slide please? It was very clear that volunteering is not a casual activity. It's not about if it's Tuesday afternoon, then it's the hospice. For many volunteers, it was very much about life and identity, about their whole way of being. Volunteers reflected very deeply on their experiences um, and the work could be really quite emotionally demanding, which I, I don't think it would, would really be very surprising. Um, volunteers, it brought volunteers new perspectives on um, illness, um, on life and on death and facing their own mortality in some cases. But it also brought fulfilment and joy and laughter and sadness. There were a lot of contrasts within the experiences on the light side to the, to, to the, the, the difficult side. But above all, many described it as a privilege. There were many similarities across the countries, which was really, really interesting. And I think it's very clear that hospice and palliative care volunteering is indeed a global movement and a way of being. And could I have the next slide, please? Just before we hear from Catherine, Monica and Anissa, I would like to leave you with a quote from an Austrian volunteer, which touched us all very deeply. And I hope will leave you in no doubt of the significance of this vital and important work that volunteers undertake everywhere. Volunteers said to us, the encounters with people coming into the day hospice leaves painful marks on my soul. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to Lena. 
Okay, thank you, Ross. So now the very important part of this webinar are uh, the real stories of our volunteers. And I would like to uh, introduce uh, Catherine Renard from France who uh, has been volunteering for many years also in, in the UK and in France. And she is now working also for the national organization, the SPAP in France. And may, may we have your story now. Uh, so what do you do as a volunteer and what does volunteering mean to you, Catherine? So, uh, yes, as you say, I have I've been a volunteer for 21 years, nine years in England and 11 years in France. Um, I am part of the big uh, French organization as well, but I, I absolutely want to keep, um, to be a volunteer, being um, with people in their vulnerability. And this is really which, um, this helped me to do more uh, big job with the organization. Uh, as a volunteer, I go to a unit in a small um, hospital here in lot et garonne in France. I go there um, about once a week. Um, or in France, we, we have a special a specialty that uh, volunteering is part of the lay, of the law, sorry, of the law, of the palliative care law, means it's quite... Um, um, it's quite straight. We, we can't do a lot of things like I used to do in England. In France, mainly volunteering is listening. And uh, so uh, we go to the unit, we knock the door, we pre I present myself and say, hello, my name is Catherine. I am coming to, to spend a, a small time with you. And uh, sometimes people are really uh, welcoming, but uh, sometimes people say, no, thank you, I am too tired, or no, thank you, because they don't really understand, in a way, uh, who are these people uh, not being a nurse or not being a doctor coming into their bedroom. Um, but it's why um, I organized a few years ago, I said we, we have to maybe propose something else as well, and my purpose is to really um, bring life till the end in this uh, unit. And so uh, every other Friday, we do a special event. Then we bring um, alcohol, we bring uh, fruit juice, we bring um, any kind of uh, nice things like a small piece of fruit, some pâté as well. And we do like what we call an aperitif in France, because in France on Friday, we like to relax and to have an, an aperitif. So uh, we decided that we have to bring that as well in the unit. And it has been, I would like to invite everybody to spend this experience because it's just incredible against last Friday. It was just uh, so nice. We used to do that in the big room for family, but because of the COVID, of course, during COVID, we, we had to stop, but we have been back for about six months now. And uh, um, we, we go room to room with a little trolley and with all these things, and we could see the eyes of the people. Some people, they can't eat anything, but they eat what we bring there because it's a bit better than the food in the hospital, I can promise. Uh, this is one of the things we do. We, as well, uh, on Wednesday, we offer ice cream. Uh, offering ice cream, not just to offer ice cream, of course, as we did a blog about this subject. And uh, the, the title of the blog was uh, Breaking the Ice with Ice Cream. And this is exactly what it is as well. In fact, the ice cream is um, an excuse to, to listen to the people. And these ice cream here are magical because uh, they really open the mouth, open the heart as well. So, yes, we bring a lot of life in the, in the service. We are as well decorate the service for Christmas. We are already uh, thinking about what we can do. And as well, um, we do a lot in my part of France, we do a lot of home visits. Um, and I do home visits as well. I like that because this is another 
atmosphere, another link with the people. And um, usually as well, we are here to, to ask this simple question, what can I do for you? So this is really magical. The people are quite as well very surprised that uh, some um, people from the society uh, come to, to them and they say, you don't have a job, you don't do anything. But uh, uh, so we have to speak a little bit about our life, but uh, the main purpose is to listen to them. And as well, at home, which is great, is really to help the family and the people around the, the person because uh, usually they need a lot, a lot of support. I have been um, visiting a young man, 42. He has a, a very, very uh, awful disease. I don't know how to say that uh, in English. It's uh, LSA. Um, his muscles are really uh, dysfunctioning and he can't move any part of his body. He used to climb some very high mountain, but now he's in his bed. I'm sure you know this um, disease, which is really awful. And I've been visiting him and his uh, mother for four years now. So you can imagine um, um, this is a different relation, of course, than people you see just once. So I can nearly call them friends. They call me friends, actually. I know in voluntary we don't have to make too much strong relation, but um, this is how is life. After four years, you 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 bring your contact very very strong. Um, and why maybe Alina, you are going to ask me why I do this voluntary? <laughs> this is very often what the friends around or people around me say. Oh, this must be so awful and so sad and. And I say, no, actually, uh, sometimes when I go to the hospital, I could feel a bit tired and my week has been quite hard. And, but uh, I see the people in the unit or at home visit. And when I go out, I am full of joy, full of, full of, <laughs> full of flower, full of uh, thanks to to the nature, to the life, because uh, to give me this uh, opportunity to, to live this kind of volunteering is just amazing. And, um, and I think uh, that's it. And why, just to explain uh, why I am in this volunteering, because I, I used to ask the question to myself as well. Um, I think we all come to this volunteering with a story. My story is that I lost my father in a car crash when I was 17, a long time ago, and I felt so lonely, so alone. Um, I wanted to, to speak with my father more. I had a lot of things to, to ask him again. And uh, that was cut suddenly. And I think when I arrived in England, I discovered palliative care. I, um, I felt really uh, at my right place. So this is me. Thank you for asking me to, to, be, to be part of this uh, webinar. So thank you very much, Catherine also for, for your touching story and, and the great ideas uh, from France with, uh, with wine and, and ice cream. I think we can all learn about this uh, joyful life of the French people. Thank you very much. So let's move to Austria where we have uh, Professor Monika Niedermeyer who is working as a volunteer in Tirol in Innsbruck. And... Uh, um, what do you do as a volunteer and what does it mean to you, Monica? Can you share your experiences with us, please? Yes, yeah, thank you very much for your kind invitation. I'm really happy to be here and part, being part of such a great community. Well, I've been working as a volunteer for the Tyrol Hospice for um, 10 years now. And I started the whole thing uh, 10 years ago, thinking of my mother who lived then 500 kilometers far away from me, 
at that time she was um, 86 and uh, she lived near Vienna and I could not care as much as I wanted for her at that time because simply because of the distance and so I thought I might give my care to other people and I am very much sure that she will get some love and care from other people who do the same as I do. And that uh, was one of my starting points. Um, the other one was that when I was in my early 20s, my father died with cancer. At the end, he had only 40 kilos. And we as a family were rather helpless. I'm now 58. And at that time, when he died, uh, there was no palliative care or hospice, uh, not on the countryside at all. And so uh, I really felt what a challenge this situation was for my family. We all were really exhausted and really were kind of happy when he died because all this nightmare had an end. On the other hand, of course, we were very sad. So all these feelings uh, together uh, made me left quite uh, without answers. It was big questions, no answers. And then I had a dog who was trained as um, a therapy dog, and I thought it might be a nice idea to go to uh, the old people's rest home. Then I met someone who told me, do you know, there is uh, an education for volunteers at the hospice. And so the whole thing started. I used to go to an old people's rest home, which is very, very close to my home, which is very important for me because uh, I work at university as a professor there. I am a jurist and I have very little time. So I have to be quite careful how I spend my time. And I don't uh, want to spend too much time on traveling around uh, visiting people. So this is really a wonderful opportunity for me. Just uh, going two minutes and then I'm there where I want to be. And before COVID, I was there once week in the afternoon for three or four hours just um, talking to people taking them for a stroll uh, playing cards whatever they wanted helping them with the food and then COVID came and this really was uh, yeah difficult thing for me also because I wanted to be there but I was not allowed to be there and um, I realized that I lost contact. Though uh, the organization was very keen on keeping contact with all the volunteers, but of course it was very difficult. In, in the Tyrol, we had a specific situation. Uh, we had uh, one of the very first lockdowns, hard lockdowns, where we were not even allowed to leave the house without a reasonable uh, thing, like me, I had a dog and I had to go out, but other people really had to stay at home for six weeks. Um, not just uh, yes, being able to go for shops, but that was it. And then I, I realized something, uh, not really many people, but quite a lot of people, um, died in the old people's rest home because of not only COVID, but they were old. And uh, also my mother died um, May, one and a half years ago. And then I uh, found a new field of possibilities for me because I started to contact the family members, which I knew partly and asked them how they were in their grief, how they felt, how, 
how terrible the whole situation was. And I think a lot came out of my own experience because my mother died. And I was, it was so difficult to, to get to her. And I was a little late. She died one hour before I arrived in Vienna. And it was so difficult to go to the hospital and to see her, her lying there still in the hospital. She died very fast within 24 hours, but it was all a big muddle for us. It was very difficult. But out of this situation, my idea grew to contact family members after a loss. And that's what I still do now, but I will go back to uh, my original working place in, in the old people's rest home. Um, I still work with um, partners of died ones uh, who are in their grief. And the good thing is that we do not need any room for this. We do not need uh, anything because we can do this walking around in a park, for example. So we meet, I go for a short stroll, half an hour, three quarters of an hour, as long as it takes, sometimes short because the weather's not nice. But that's my way of um, doing something good for the others and for me. And um, I can even take my little doggy with them. They love it. And I think this also is a very important part of the whole thing because it's not only uh, the, the old people, the dying ones, but it's the whole system that needs comfort. And that's my way of dealing with the whole COVID situation. <laughs> and I hope I can come back pretty soon. I am right now in Austria, the situation is getting worse, really bad, I think. And I might not go there till, I don't know, January probably, but I'll see. Thank you very much, Monica, for your sharing your experiences with us. Thank you. And thank you very much. I'm so glad to be part of the whole thing. Really, yes. Thank you. So uh, then our uh, youngest uh, generation here, Enisa Sabotik. Now it's your turn. You come from uh, Belfast, from Serbia. And um, I heard that you are only six, 26 years old. So maybe you can tell us how you how you found Bell Hospice and, and what do you do as a volunteer and what does it mean to you? Well, hello everyone again. I'm, as I said, I'm very happy to be a part of this event uh, in this one big room where we are all now from all around the world and to share my story and my experience after Catherine and Monica and after reading all of the volunteering stories, I realized that uh, we all uh, shared the same experience, less or more. We shared the same, same emotions, uh, the same reasons why we started. And uh, it, felt, it, it made me feel not lonely. When I started this, uh, I was uh, in my third year of university and we were offered to uh, begin kind of internship and uh, to choose where do we want to volunteer. Uh, I was really having uh, second thoughts about uh, was this the right choice for me? I was really afraid. I was scared because uh, Two or three months before I started my training, I had a personal experience in my close family. And it really, really was, uh, as Monica said, uh, we were all uh, lost. We were um, in a lot of pain. We, we needed the stuff that we didn't get. And uh, I didn't know about Bell Hospice. Uh, when I started my training, uh, and I realized that uh, it could be 
the best idea or the, the worst thing that I can do to myself. So it was one or the other when I started. And uh, at first, uh, after the training and uh, on the training, we hear uh, another people's stories. The other volunteers shared their experience. Uh, and it made me feel that I can do that. I will try and we will see what will be. And uh, at first, uh, I started going with a social worker or a doctor to uh, another people's houses, our patients. Uh, and uh, as uh, Catherine said, we were expected not to, not to get too attached, but it doesn't work that way. With me, it doesn't because uh, in my uh, community and my friends, uh, they all tease me about it. I'm famous. Uh, to cry about everything <laughs> and I'm usually uh, um, like a rain <laughs> if you tell me some sad story with, when, when Catherine and Monica shared their experience I was really um, how do, I, I was scared to start because um, uh, it gave me the feeling from the beginning when I started uh, I wasn't sure if I'm going to be able not to cry, uh, to be separated uh, from the stories, from the people's houses, because every time you go at uh, someone's house, you get uh, to be a part of their family. You get overflowed with the emotions, uh, depending on the state of the patient. Everything uh, hits you. And uh, you get to choose either you're going to uh, be yourself and, and let, let yourself be yourself and feel all the kind of emotions and thoughts going around the room and the family, or you're going to quit. And um, uh, when I finished my uh, internship, I decided to stay in Bell Hospice and to try things like uh, daycare. Uh, and uh, continuing to uh, going to people's houses and help them uh, with uh, paying bills if they need something from the grocery store and, and such stuff. And uh, I started going to Slavka. And um, for the next three years, three and a half years, uh, uh, I was a volunteer at her home. At first, uh, it was... Uh, Really, really strange because uh, I was still in the uh, doubt, should I let myself in or should I be reserved? And uh, we had a ritual every Sunday at uh, 1 p.m. I uh, come to her and we drink coffee. That's how it started. We started talking about books, movies, uh, traveling, uh, photos, and such a stuff, like life, lifetime experience. She shared with me and I was there to, to listen, but uh, as the time passed, uh, I shared my, my experiences. And uh, by the time uh, we, we became friends. Uh, after that, I tried daycare and uh, we had uh, some workshops like uh, Easter workshops uh, where we uh, come here and uh, paint the eggs, made some cards for the new year and stuff. And um, as COVID came, it all stopped and changed. And uh, we had to find a way to continue that uh, relation. So we uh, started by phone calls. And it was really strange because when we speak on the phone, you cannot see the face expression. You are not sure how do they feel. You can only rely on the voice, on the pauses while talking. So it was really, really strange. And uh, like half a year ago, uh, Slavka passed away. And it was really hard. But we were prepared because uh, we had three years to share everything. And I knew that at some point it's all gonna stop, but I was wrong. 
it didn't stop because uh, from the moment she passed away, it uh, began. It began to uh, be a, a part of my life. All the stories, all the experiences, all the advices she gave me, they're here for my whole life. So that's, that's my experience. Thank you very much. I think we have heard now what we have been working for also in this task force so that this kind of help can be organized in, in all countries of this world. And, and also it is very important also for the volunteers, like we heard to yourself, uh, to be part of, of this hospice and palliative care. And um, thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us. And thank you for everybody who has contributed uh, to our book, which will be now uh, introduced by Catherine. But Ross, now it's your turn. Thank you very much, Enisa. Ross, you're muted. Ross, <laughs> we can't hear you. I'd just like to add my thanks to Catherine and Monica and Anissa. I think these stories were very moving and it's wonderful to hear them um, directly from you. Um, I'm now going to ask Catherine if she would um, launch our online book of volunteer experiences and uh, could we possibly have the slide with the information? Thank you very much. Thank you, Roz. Thank you, Lena. And so I'm here with a slightly different hat on now as a, a representative of the EAPC board to uh, be delighted to launch this wonderful resource that the EAPC Volunteer Task Force have developed which is the colourful life of volunteering in Europe. And if you follow the QR code that's on the screen, it should take you to where they're hosted on the EAPC website. We know, we've heard how volunteers are such a vital part of hospice and palliative care and an important element of the support that's offered to patients and families. You've heard from Roz and Lena and the other presenters today how this project was inspired and how it was undertaken because those stories of the volunteers are really important and we need to hear directly from the volunteers themselves to understand what it is like to be a volunteer and to start to understand the impact that those volunteers can have. And the stories published in this online book tell of the really deep impact upon the volunteers of being alongside people who have palliative and end-of-life care needs and their families. They talk about the meaning and experience of volunteering and those really deep human connections that are made through those conversations that we've just been hearing about from the volunteers themselves and the inspiration and privilege that people feel about accompanying people at such a difficult and important time in their lives. As Ros said, it's not undertaken casually. It's a, it's a significant and major part of someone's life and it can change the volunteer's perception on life, death and their own mortality. So we wanted to make these stories accessible to as many people as possible. And they're published in the language of the volunteer alongside an English translation. And they're published in two parts. You can see that there's uh, book one, which has stories from Austria, Finland, France, and Germany. And book two, which has stories from Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, Serbia, and the UK. They were collected before the COVID-19 pandemic and we've already heard about the huge impact that that has had on the experience of volunteering. Um, but we want to still highlight the significance of that contribution and to really use this as a stepping point to build on the best of those pre-pandemic times as hospice and palliative care evolves 
alongside COVID-19 and the way that we can continue to reinvent uh, volunteering for perhaps this new phase in uh, European volunteering. So I, on behalf of the EAPC board, commend this to you and also just wanted to ask, add some personal thanks to everybody that's been involved in the volunteering task force over the years. It's been a privilege to work alongside some of them as the board link more recently, but of course, much of the work predates uh, that and with many people involved. I think they've done a huge amount to highlight the importance of volunteering um, in hospice and palliative care services across Europe. So thank you, a really heartfelt thank you. Um, a fantastic uh, task force and a fantastic legacy, which hopefully others will be able to move forwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, uh, for your touching words uh, as a launch of our online books. I think uh, we are very happy and proud uh, that we can now introduce these books to you and thus take them out to the world and, and, and share it with, uh, with your colleagues and, and with everybody that you know and, and, and volunteers. I think it's, it is wonderful to read these, these stories. I have read many of them from different countries and to see also the cultural differences in, in these stories. And I have, uh, sometimes I have cried when I, I, I read some of the stories. So it's really worth reading and take your time and, and the peace to, to enjoy and, and read these stories. Um, yes, now you have heard uh, very much about uh, our task force. Actually, we have had two task forces uh, that I had a very uh, good time with my uh, Ross, uh, who has become now actually a very good friend, and I hope we will stay friends after this, and I'm very sure about this. Uh, I think it has been an amazing uh, time together with you, because we came together as strangers. The EAPC, Sheila Payne, told us that you could do uh, well together. So as when we both said, okay, we would be interested in, in starting a task force at the EAPC. And uh, I think it's it's really amazing. We've been working together for eight years and we haven't uh, had any problems at that time. And I think that's really something very special. So thank you, Ross, for all this, all this great time with you. As, as you all uh, understand now, uh, this task force is going to, is coming now to an end. But we have also good news for people who would like to uh, work more internationally uh, on, on uh, volunteering. There is a plan that Catherine uh, Walsh, together with Stephen uh, van der Stichelen, will start a new, uh, like a third uh, EAP task force on volunteering. And uh, most of our board members are very happy to, to join this new task force then. So we Wish you good luck uh, with the new task force. But before we go to that, we would like to thank many, many people who have uh, supported us. And uh, I would like to say now thank you to all the steering group members from past and present, the colleagues and friends in, in so many countries who have contributed in so many different ways to our work. And the first task force there uh, was uh, Rosalma Padino. I saw Rosalma, yet you are here today. Uh, she's from Italy. Anne Gusesen has taken part on, on both, uh, both um, task forces. She comes from the Netherlands. In the beginning was Piotr Krakowiak from Poland with us. Now Lesek uh, uh, has uh, helped us in many, many ways. Uh, Lukas Ratko from Germany, who was also an EAPC president for many years. He has been in both, uh, both um, task forces. Thank you, Lukas, for all your help. And Jos Somsen from the Netherlands was very active in the first uh, task force. Thank you, Jos. And Sheila Payne has been uh, very, very, um, how should I say, 
a wise person who has helped us in very many different ways. Thank you, Sheila, very much for all of your contribution. It has been very great to work with you too. Uh, the ta task for two, we have uh, Miki Bokicevic from Serbia. Now uh, Katarina Sipcevic has uh, taken his part and Chiara Carafa from Italy and uh, Beatrice Manea was a couple of months with us uh, from Sir Romania. And of course, Catherine Renard that you heard already today and Stephen who will be uh, continuing our work. Also, we have uh, had a great cooperation with the EAPC board and uh, Professor Bill Larkin as a past president uh, has also um, encouraged and guided us very much. And of course, Professor uh, Christoph Ostgart, the EAPC president at the moment, he has written the foreword to our books. And of course, Julie Ling as a CEO, she's always very an important contact and she has supported our work a lot. And Joan, uh, Joan, Joan Brennan and Kathy Payne, who have also organized this webinar on behalf of EAPC. Thank you to you. And uh, I think a very special thanks must go to Avril Jackson, who has been so helpful and encouraging in publishing blogs and circulating information about our works through uh, the EAPC media platforms. As a thank you very much. It's a pleasure to work together with you. And um, I would like to uh, um, thank also uh, Hospice Austria and our president Valtra Klasnik, who has encouraged me to, to work internationally and have given me the, the possibility to do this. And uh, also the Erste Foundation in Austria it is a part of a bank uh, who has uh, help us financially to organize the, the uh, symposia that we have organized in the EAPC uh, congresses. But most of all, most important of all, I would like to thank all hospice and palliative care volunteers everywhere in this world for the amazing and important work that you do and the huge difference that you make to people's lives. Thank you very much. And now Ross would like to um, say something in another way to us. Ross, you are muted. By the end of this task force, I will have learned to unmute myself. Um, just to say, I echo everything that Lena said. It's been wonderful working with you. Um, it's been wonderful working with both task forces. Um, we've made some very special friendships. And once the pandemic's over, hopefully we can start to visit each other again. Um, we've heard a lot today about volunteering, a lot of very moving um, things about volunteering and, and what it means and how COVID has changed this. And this is a few words from um, the late Ivan Shire, from the USA, who was um, a pioneer um, in thinking about volunteering. And I'm thinking of Anissa here because I rarely get through this without tears, so I shall do my very best. Once volunteering was for dreamers, we were, and some still are, pioneers in compassionate enterprise. It was the way we got good things done before there were big budgets or bureaucracies. Once volunteering was a legacy, it was an inheritance from family, friends, or faith, an unselfconscious way of living out basic values. Volunteering was just the way we were, a private matter of public consequence. Once volunteering was a power, we didn't react to trends, we caused them. We didn't supplement staff, we created them. Politicians didn't use us, we used them. And we made dreams happen. Once volunteering was for dreamers, may it soon be so again. Thank you.
I think that brings us to the end of this webinar and thank you everyone who's joined us and everyone who's shared their stories, everyone who's asked questions. And we will try and get um, the questions, the answers to the questions that we didn't manage to answer to you after the webinar. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>